I got books. I got some new books for the new year. I don't feel that bad about these actually because I really didn't spend anything on them. Two, I found on the side of the road. Three, I reclaimed from my childhood home. Four of them I got at a thrift store for $2 cumulatively. One of them is from a publisher. Another was a Christmas gift from grandma. And the last one was a birthday gift, a used birthday gift that I got for myself because, you know, why not? I deserve it. So let's, let's get into it. Grab yourself a nice cold or warm bevy and let's have fun. This is not a beer. Okay, so why don't we start with the books that I got for the startlingly low price of four for two dollars. The first one, I was really surprised that I was able to find it, and an autographed copy that looks like it hasn't even been read is The Seas by Samantha Hunt. Feels like everybody loved this book this year, and when I saw it, I said, that's a sign. And it's from one of my favorite bookstores with the bookmark still intact. So this is what? A gothic fairy tale about a love-sickened girl who may be a mermaid trapped in an alcoholic town beside a deeply haunted sea. Creepy and poetic, subversive and strangely funny, The Seas is a phenomenal piece of literature. That's just one of the quotes on the back. I don't really see a actual rundown of it, but everybody loves this. And I feel like this will be a quick read, a good winter read, you know, a good in the feels read, which I'm all excited about. So there's the first one. Yeah. The second one that I got was The Bluest Eye by Toni Morrison. Toni Morrison, the Tony, with an eye. This, I remember an old coworker of mine was in love with this book and she was telling me about it when we were walking out of a horrible job together. It, it wasn't that bad, but it just wasn't that enjoyable. And she was so passionate about this. So. This says, Pecola Breedlove, a young black girl, prays every day for beauty. Mocked by other children for the dark skin, curly hair, and brown eyes that set her apart, she yearns for the blonde hair and blue eyes that she believes will allow her to finally fit in. Yet as her dream grows more fervent, her life slowly starts to disintegrate in the face of adversity and strife. A brilliant examination of our obsession with beauty and conformity, Toni Morrison's virtuosity Virtuo virtuosic. I can never say that word. Toni Morrison's virtuosic. virtuosic first novel asks powerful questions about race, class, and gender with the subtlety and grace that have always characterized her writing. So, excited about this. Can't wait. Another winter read, I feel, or maybe spring. I feel like this might be a good spring read. We have the vegetarian. I don't know who put all these books into this one specific thrift store, but they knew that I was coming. They knew that I was in the vicinity and they said, let me drop them. Let me drop them. Cause again, this is like an amazing condition. I read, what's the other book? Human Acts, Human Acts. I read that and that was crazy. Darkly beautiful modern classic about rebellion, eroticism and the female body. One of the most extraordinary books you will ever read. I've only heard amazing things about this and I'm probably going to pick this up way sooner than later because I collapse to peer impressions. What can I say? What can I say? But honestly, this looks fantastic and everything I've heard about it is just applause. So I hope to contribute to that. Yes. Okay. And the last of the four that I got for the astonishingly low price of $2 is White Teeth by Zadie Smith. Now, I have heard that this book divides people. People either love it or hate it, and I'm hoping to love it because I love Zadie Smith. I think that she's incredibly classy, so witty, so well-read, so well-written, you know? And I think I'm gonna love it. I don't know, I, it's a really beefy, Beefy Baby, which I also am in the mood for. I love a Beefy Baby. One of the most talked about fictional debuts of recent years, White Teeth is a funny, generous, big-hearted novel adored by critics and readers alike, dealing with, among many other things, friendship, love, war, three cultures and three families over three generations, and the tricky way the past has of coming back and biting you on the ankle. It is a life-affirming, riotous must-read of a book. 
biting you on the ankle. I call sweatpants that are tight around the ankle, ankle biters. So all of the main characters in my mind will be wearing ankle biter sweatpants for the duration of this novel. I can't wait. All right, let's get into, oh, this is cute. Grandma looking out for me. I got this from my grandma for Christmas and I wanted to put this on there because I do plan on reading this book. I've never heard of this book, but grandma got it for me. And you know what? I'm excited to read it. This is The Last Train to London by Meg Waite Clayton, a national bestseller. Set in the pre-World War II era, based on the true story of the kinder transport rescue of 10,000 children from Nazi-occupied Europe and one brave woman who helped them escape. Oh, wow. There's a huge blur, but I don't feel like reading it all. Truss Wigschmuller. A childless Dutch woman risks her life to smuggle children out of Nazi-occupied lands to the nations that will take them. I saw it and I can't wait to read it. Why not? I think it'll be fun. If you've read it, let me know. Let me know if Grandma was right in choosing it. Why not? And then, this is the book that I got myself, a complete contrast from what my grandmother got me, but you know, there's two sides of the spectrum to me. I am really a person full of surprises. So the book that I picked up for myself was The Piano Teacher. Don't ask me to say Elfriede Jelinek's name because I know I said that wrong and I should have looked it up beforehand, but I totally forgot. So please excuse me. I knew about the movie before and this is actually a still from the movie and usually I absolutely hate everything that has to do with movie image book covers, but there was something about this one that just Yes, absolutely. And I had seen this in a couple of other used bookstores and I really was not intrigued by the cover. I'm kind of particular, I guess, but this one I absolutely love. And this was actually, I didn't know this, the winner of the Nobel Prize for Literature. And I think this was published in 1998. 1988. Very close. So this is a very scandalous book and it says, Erica Kohut teaches piano at the Vienna Conservatory by day, but by night she trawls the porn shows of Vienna while her mother, whom she loves and hates in equal measure, waits up for her. Into this emotional pressure cooker bounds music student and ladies' man, Walter Klemmer. With Walter as her student, Erica spirals out of control, consumed by the ecstasy of self-destruction. Yes, and I will watch the movie after I finish this because it is on HBO and I've been putting it off for the longest time because I knew I wanted to read the book. So finally, things can happen. And to sort of piggyback off of the fun of that book, I was sent by Avid Reader Press. My girl Katya over there knows me very, very well. And she said, hey, I have a book with an amazing title. Do you want it? And I said, with that title, yes, I do. And it's Butts. Butts. <laughs> a backstory. Oh, what a good play on words. So this is, I guess, just the history of the female butt and how it has been scrutinized for years and praised, abhorred, and um, everything that has to do with it. The female butt in particular is forever being scrutinized, criticized, and objectified, but why? In butts, a backstory. Reporter, essayist, and Radio Lab contributing editor Heather Radke is determined to find out. Part deep dive reportage, part personal journey, part cabinet of curiosities, this vivid cultural history takes us from the performance halls of 19th century London to the aerobic studios of the 1980s. From the music video set of Sir mix lots Baby Got Back to the mountains of Arizona, where every year humans and horses race in a feat of gluteal endurance. <laughs> Naming my band that. Along the way, Radke encounters evolutionary biologists who study how butts first developed, fit models whose measurements have defined gene sizings for millions of women, and fitness girls who created fads like buns of steel. She uncovers the central importance of race through profiles of historical and pop culture figures like Sarah Bartman, Josephine Baker, and Jennifer Lopez. The result is an entertaining, illuminating, and thoughtful examination of why certain silhouettes come in and out of fashion, and how larger ideas about race control, liberation, and power influence our most private feelings about ourselves and others. Booty. I can't wait to read this. That is just great. 
great. Let's talk about the books that I found on the side of the road. Now I'm going to be starting a shorts series. I know everybody's a little bit ambivalent about shorts, but I figured if I was going to use shorts, I would maybe start a little side series on it. And it's going to be books I find on the side of the road in New York City. I have an accompanying theme song that I'll play for you right here. Three books by the side of the road in a new York City. Yes, that is me on lead vocals. Anyway, I found uh, Crime and Punishment by Dostoevsky on the side of the road. It is a very old version. Its pages are paper thin and it makes it look like it's much shorter than uh, it really is. I don't know if I'll get to this this year. It is a goal of mine to really dig deeper into classics this year. I would like to start reading this. And I think the fact that this really beautiful copy was on the side of the road was indicative of me leaning more into that direction. It's there for a reason. I picked it up. I had to. Crime and punishment. Side of the road. Let's do it, baby. And to weirdly match with that, about, I don't know, a month before I found Crime and Punishment, I picked up this old version of A Movable Feast by Hemingway. I like Hemingway a lot. I enjoy his writing. I have visited his home in the Keys in Florida, and that really was a moving experience for me. And from my impression, A Movable Feast is one of his kind of more, I don't know, culturally satisfying books. It's all about Paris, which I love, and all of the groups that kind of circle around and have fun in Paris. I think I'll read that very, very soon, but I was so floored to see that. And what are the chances that two amazingly old books on the side of the road, hopefully not filled with asbestos, we're just waiting for me, just ready for me to take a journey with them. So I can't complain, I'm very excited. I'm not gonna throw those on the bed. I'm not, no way. Those will stay on the ground. <laughs> I care. Okay, and the last three books are books that I took from my family home when I was there for the holidays. I accidentally took these back in a big box of all of my gifts. And uh, I figured, okay, well, now that they're in my immediate sphere, I should pick them up. Well, actually, I take that back. There's two of them that I accidentally took back. One of them was an intentional take back, which I will be returning back to my home, but we'll get into that. The first unintentional taking into the city book is John Updike of The Farm. I started reading this when I was about 18 years old and I was on a flight to Hawaii. I don't think that I was intelligent enough to understand it, and who knows if I'm intelligent enough now to understand it, but I'm going to give it another try. I haven't read any of John Updike and I do want to get more into him. I feel like as an American writer, I am intrigued to see how he portrays specifically the middle class, because I feel like that is what he's kind of known for. On the back, it says, when Joey Robinson, a 35-year-old advertiser, consultant in Manhattan returns with his newly acquired second wife Peggy and his 11 year old stepson Richard to the farm where he grew up. It is an adventure. <laughs> I love that. Simple. For three days, a quartet of voices explores the air, relating stories, making confessions, seeking solace, hoping for love. But all of their emotional meanderings pale with tragedy strikes. Tragedy that separates them further. Tragedy that draws them closer. So we'll see. It's a small one, but let's see how it goes. I'm hoping that it's not like William Maxwell's So Long, See You Tomorrow on the bed. And the second book that was unintentionally brought back to New York City is a book that I feel like maybe it's time for me to read. This is a book that my old English teacher from high school gave me a while back not that long ago. He gave this to me. He said it was one of his favorite books and another fellow classmate of mine, she loved this so much that she got a tattoo about it and I really respected her opinion and her writing as well. So let's see if this lives up to it. This is At Swim Two Boys by Jamie O'Neill. Set in Dublin, At Swim Two Boys follows the year to Easter 1916, the time of Ireland's brave but fractured uprising against British rule. O'Neill tells the story of the love of two boys, Jim, a naive and reticent scholar, and the younger son of the foolish aspiring shopkeeper, Mr. Mac, and Doyler, the dark, rough diamond son of Mr. Mac's old army pal. Doyler might at once have made a scholar like Jim, might once have had prospects like Jim, but his folks sent him to work, and now, schoolboy no more, he hauls the 
parish midden cart with socialism and revolution and willful blasphemy stuffed under his cap. And yet the future is rosy. Jim's father is sure. His elder son is away fighting the Hun for God in the British Army, and he has plans for Jim and the other in their corner shop empire. But Mr. Mack cannot see that the landscape is changing, nor does he realize the depths of Jim's burgeoning friendship with Doyler. Out at the 40 foot, that great jet of rock where gentlemen bathe in the scandalous nude, the two boys meet day after day. There they make a pact. Doyler would teach Jim to swim, and in a year, Easter 1916, they will swim to the bay to the distant beacon of Muglin's Rock and claim that island for themselves. That wasn't as satisfying as I thought it would be. So let's see. Let's see if I can finally make it there. Why am I, I I'm, <laughs> I'm giving myself an Irish accent and I'm not sure why. I mean, I do know why this has a power to it, but <laughs> I like can't get out of it. Very weird. And the last book that I intentionally brought back and that I've had here for a little while and I wanted to show you a book that I will, a, a, a mix, a compilation of things that I plan on reading in the winter is um, Robert Frost poems. My father loves Robert Frost and Robert Frost's home is near where I'm from. And I feel like someone who grew up in the isolated cold of a New England home should read Robert Frost poems. And I plan on reading that this winter. So if you have any Robert Frost and you would like to read it as well, this winter is going to be the winter that I read Robbie. My neighbors upstairs are screaming and I can't stand them. Anyway, let me take another swig of the old drink. Oh, Club Mate is an acquired taste, that's for sure. Anyway, before my neighbors get too debilitatingly loud upstairs, I just want to say that you're wonderful, you're fabulous. Thank you so much for being here. I love it. You're, <laughs> you're wonderful, you're fabulous. Thank you so much for being here. If you have any of these books, let me know. What did you buy this holiday season? What did you buy for the new year? Let me know. Let's have fun together. And pray for me that I don't do something out of control to these neighbors. Bye.